Bangkok Arbitrator and Vice Chair of Bangkok Arbitration Club. Today, I will be a moderator for the opening ceremony of Bangkok Arbitration Club. Our event today, we will have many interesting sections. To start with the opening remark by His Honor Judge Sotlowit Lim Palangsi, the Chief Judge of the Office of President of Supreme Court, and Kun Nopamad Tamati Techo, the founder and chair of Bangkok Arbitration Club. Following by the webinar, uh, following, uh, following, we will have uh, the webinar and panel discussion by our distinguished speaker on the topic of dealing with jurisdictional uh, challenge, evidently issue across international tribunal in the investor state arbitration and essential for enforceable arbitrage arbitral award accordingly. Now, let's start with the first section. We are honored to have His Honor Judge Solowit Limpa Langsi, the Chief Judge of the Office of President of the Supreme Court, to give the welcome speech for everyone. Please allow me to introduce His Honor Judge Solowit to everyone. Judge Solowit is currently the Chief Judge of the Office of President of the Supreme Court. He was just in the research division of the Court of Appeal, Chief Judge of Nakhon Sawan, Juvenile and Family Court, research Judge of the Court of Appeal for specialized case. His education background, he graduated from Bachelor of Law degree with honor from Thammasat University, Barrister at Law, Master degree with distinction from Columbia University, the United States, and Master of Law from University of Michigan, the United States. Now, everybody, please welcome His Honor Judge Solowit. Thank you very much, Akun Dusudi, for your kind introduction. So it is my pleasure to join this inauguration event hosted by the Bangkok Arbitration Club and the TAI. Uh, by nature, when we inaugurate something, it means that we are starting some new chapter. I believe that uh, this new chapter of the Bangkok Arbitration Club will provide a new and interesting path for arbitration and arbitrators in Thailand. So the path for an arbitrator is also a very interesting and challenging one as well. It starts when one wants to become an arbitrator. It is not an easy task to get the recognition to be included in the panel or roster of an arbitral institution. It is also challenging to get the first appointment either by parties or at institutions. The appointment will mean a lot for an arbitrator or anyone who want to join this noble profession. However, the path and journey of an arbitrator does not end there. It will become even more challenging when an arbitrator wants to join the international arena, just as the topic of today's event, acting as international arbitrators. Even a seasoned domestic arbitrator will find very challenging to transform his or her practices to suit the need and demand of international arbitration, where various different legal cultures, methodologies, and practices are all put into a mixer. The learning curve of an arbitrator will depend on how receptive the arbitrator is for new perspective and the willingness to expand his or her practice horizon. Legal practitioners and arbitrators in Thailand may be familiar with the induction of witnesses in the trad traditional sequential manner. When going to the international arena, they may have to make themselves accustomed to the taking of ex expert witnesses in the hot tub, for example. The law governing the substantive and procedural issue will likely Com comprise more than one set of rules. They cannot impose the domestic view on the case that require other views, interpretation and application of the laws and the rules. 
So therefore, I believe that today's event will be a significant stepping stone for arbitrators and practitioners alike who want to be well prepared for various challenging issues that they might confront them when they participate in, in an international arbitral proceeding. So on behalf of TAI, I would like to thank all speaker at the Bangkok Arbitration Club for making today's event possible. I am certain that so please enjoy all the sessions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Jess Salawit, for the uh, exclusive uh, opening remark and the overview of uh, arbitration both in Thailand and, inter and international level. Uh, okay, so the next, uh, I would like to invite Kunnopama uh, uh, to provide us the welcome speech. But before that, please allow me to introduce Kunnopama to everyone. Kunnopama is an experienced litigator and arbitrator with over 20 years experience. She has substantial experience in international litigation and arbitration gained from numerous cases from Singapore, Cambodia, Myanmar, and Laos. She particularly sought after her experience in arbitration and is known for her skill navigation for both international rule, for example, ANSITA rule, SIAC, ICC, HKIAC, and GAFTA rule, and domestic rule uh, from TAI and TSAC. Her general practice covers various industries, including infrastructure, insurance, telecommunication, technology. She particularly known as one of the Thailand most well-regarded transportation and shipping industry lawyer. Currently, she is the court member of ICC, International Court of Arbitration. She is listed as arbitrator on several international panels such as TAI, TSAC, Arbitrator of Shanghai Arbitration Commission, Mainland China Arbitration Institutes, and Sunshine Court of International Arbitration. She is also an accredited mediator at SIMI as well in Singapore. Now, everybody, please welcome Kun Nopamat. Huh? Uh, thank you very much, Kun Dusadi, for your kind introduction. First of all, I have to thank you, Thai Arbitration Institute, TAI, uh, for co host and support our club and for this uh, inauguration event. As uh, uh, his honor, uh, just sort of we say that this is a new chapter uh, for us that we will make a milestone that. Uh, my, uh, to promote the Thai arbitrators to be able to uh, enter into the international arbitration practice, as well as we also uh, have to expand our networking to the international arbitration practitioners. As you can see from our panel that we try to uh, uh, connect to our friends, colleagues, and uh, uh, international arbitration uh, practitioners in, in Asia and, and in other country as well. Yes, uh, for this from for the first uh, the first thing that why we set up the Bangkok uh, Arbitration Club is to be the uh, educational organization that um, provide the uh, information knowledge and uh, uh, keep up with the uh, new, new information and update of the international arbitration arena. And as well as the educational organization, we also hope that uh, this uh, Bangkok uh, club that we call for short that uh, for this organization, it should also promote uh, our friendship to other international arbitration friends that will 
allows uh, Thai arbitrators or Thai arbitration practitioner exchange their skill and uh, their knowledge with uh, the outside, uh, the, the, the lawyers and the counsel and the arbitrator outside Thailand. Yet we not only practice only in Thailand, that's why we, we also want the Thai arbitrators to practice outside Thailand as well. This is also uh, for the, not only for the benefits of our country and also for the benefit of uh, the, the, the whole uh, arbitration uh, community as well. Apart from, apart from sharing the knowledge, we also want this uh, arbitration community to encourage the diversity for the arbitration practice, not only Thailand and for the, uh, the, the whole uh, arbitration. Diversity here is not only uh, the gender, but concerning age, et ethnicity, race, culture, political, religious belief, and the uh, uh, so, uh, social economic status that we should also not allow only the uh, specific group of the practitioner can have a privilege uh, to practice, but also we uh, should be the inclusive organization that allow uh, all interested party, including a law student, uh, the younger practitioner, uh, to be able to uh, to understand and to get familiar with the arbitration before uh, they can enter into the international arbitration arena. So uh, before I finish my uh, opening remarks, I would like to uh, make the, uh, some, some issue that we, uh, as we have all the females uh, speakers today, it is, it is not only, uh, it is not, we caught with uh, exclusive anyone, but we try to uh, make the, uh, the, the, the point that because uh, not only Thailand, but other uh, countries that I think that the, 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 the percentage of the female arbitrator in this international arbitrations, quite a low number. I think in Thailand should be uh, lower than two or three percent of the uh, female arbitrator. That's why we think that uh, the, in the institution or the other uh, arbitration constitution should uh, maybe consider if there is any room or any things that um, the, the competent female uh, arbitration practitioner can fit in uh, and they 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 competent to to handle the case. I think that there should be uh, some room for them as well. So uh, thank you, uh, TAI, that allows us to 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 express our will and also to uh, to make this uh, arbitration organization and community to be uh, inclusive for everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kun Nopamad, for the warm welcome speech. And also uh, demonstrate the main purpose of BKKF. We wish that we can bring together the Thai and international arbitration community to promote diversity and development of the practice in Thailand and also in international levels. Okay, now everybody, let's move along to our next section on the topic of dealing with jurisdictional challenge. We are honored to have Assistant Professor Dr. Tidalat Silapat Pilomsu and Mrs. Catherine Neo, our founder members to present and discuss on this topic. Let me uh, introduce firstly, uh, Assistant Professor Dr. Tidalat. She is a full-time lecturer in law faculty at Jularlongkorn University where she formerly served as a white dean for international affairs. She, spe uh, she specialized in international business transaction, international, international sale law, international investment, infrastructure project, energy and mineral law, and also uh, as meditation and settlement of mass tort claim and class actions. Her research project among other include petroleum joint 
Development Agreement, Public Procure Law, Oil Speed Settlement, for instance. Dr. Tida Lass was also officially appointed by the Council of State Office of Thailand as a committee reviewing the DAF national uh, legislation implementing the UN Convention on Contact for International Sale of Goods, 1980. Next, Mrs. Catherine Neo. She is a bilingual in English and Mandarin. She dual qualified in Singapore and Australia. She is a dispute resolution partner as PD Legal LLP in Singapore. Kathleen has a broad commercial dispute practice with experience in international arbitration, insolvency, restructuring, and mediations. She also worked closely with PD Legal China practice to SY client on cross border China related dispute. Kathleen regularly assists Prayan in managing cross-border litigation, including before the Australian Bunai Indonesia Court. Kathleen currently sits as a co-vice chair on Women in Practice Committee of Law Society in Singapore. She is also a committee member of the Beihai Asian International Arbitration Center and was also recently appointed as a chairperson of Yang SIR uh, in Singapore. So now everybody, please welcome our dis distinguished speaker. Thank you, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's very much an honor to be part of this inauguration ceremony from the Bangkok Arbitration Club, uh, high from Singapore. Having in mind that the theme today is acting as an international arbitrator, um, Dr. Tirara and I have been tasked to talk about dealing with jurisdictional challenges. So we may all be aware that challenges to the jurisdiction of an arbitral tribunal or sole arbitrator is quite common. Um, these challenges are typically based on existence of the arbitration agreement, validity of the arbitration agreement, the scope of the arbitration agreement as well as enforceability. So it's very widely accepted that the tribunal has the power to rule on its own jurisdiction because of the principle of competence, competence. So today, what I'd like to do is to move away from talking about the theory and instead cover two main areas that every arbitrator should consider in dealing with jurisdictional challenges. The first is practical considerations that an arbitrator has to keep in mind when dealing with a challenge. And second, distinguishing what actually is a jurisdictional issue and what is an admissibility issue. So the first part um, of my talk today is on practical considerations. To me, I think there are four things to keep in mind for every arbitrator. The first step is to look at the scope of your powers as an arbitrator. So look at what are the arbitration rules, look at the arbitration agreement, and sometimes the law of the seat may also help to fill in the gaps. So for example, as an arbitrator, do you have the power to grant interest or do you have the power to grant interim relief? In China, for example, the arbitration law as it now stands from what I'm aware is that it doesn't accord arbitrators the power to grant interim measures. This kind of measures has to be forwarded. This kind of request has to be given to the competent court in China. The second step that an arbitrator should think about is to ask the parties, are there any concerns regarding the arbitrator's jurisdiction? Sometimes this is especially important when a party decides not to participate in an arbitration. So you only have one party actively participating. So as an arbitrator, you have to make sure you cover all grounds. The third thing I want to cover is the timing of the challenge. So this means when did the party make a jurisdictional challenge? Did they make it early, in the middle of the arbitration, or late in the arbitration? So the arbitration has to con the arbitrator has to consider: are these measures made to delay or frustrate the arbitration? And also at the same time, such jurisdictional challenges. As an arbitrator, do you bifurcate the proceedings? This means, do you put your jurisdictional challenge first, listen to it, 
finish it up and then consider the merits of the hearing. And in this case, you have to determine whether you can consider jurisdiction without the merits of your underlying claim. Finally, as an arbitrator, in terms of timing, you also have to think about the cost of proceedings. Is it more costly for parties to hear a jurisdictional challenge with the merits or would it be more efficient and cost efficient to hear the jurisdictional objections first, come to a decision and then proceed with the merits as well? The last practical consideration uh, I have for the audience here today is how do you name your jurisdictional de decision? This is something that the arbitrator really has to think about and understand because you need to understand whether your decision can be enforced eventually. So should your decision be in the form of an award or is your decision going to be in the form of a procedural order? Most of the time, in general, if you intend to reject the challenge and you find that as an arbitrator, you have a jurisdiction, you will consider doing it in a procedural order and then make a final award on merits. However, if you have no jurisdiction, you may then consider issuing what we call a final award declining jurisdictions. But at the end of the day, it is very important to consider which jurisdiction you're talking about because there are some jurisdictions where they do not recognize a lack of jurisdiction to be made into an award. For example, from what I'm aware, in Indonesia and Philippines, they have refused, the courts have refused to enforce more than a single award in a case. And therefore, a decision confirming jurisdiction cannot be made as an award. In Singapore, for example, a ruling on jurisdiction is not to be considered an award for the purposes of the International Arbitration Act 2012. So these are some issues and practical considerations for arbitrators. The second point I would like to talk about is the issue of what exactly is a jurisdictional issue and an admissibility issue. Sometimes an arbitrator may find counsel, especially certain counsel, who may not be as experienced in defining what is a jurisdictional issue. So jurisdiction basically means the power and authority of an arbitrator to hear a case. Admissibility, on the other hand, refers to the right of a party and to bring a case, to bring a claim to the arbitral tribunal. So really, jurisdiction actually comes right before admissibility. This means the arbitrator needs to first have the power and authority to hear the case before the party can bring a claim to that arbitrator who has the power and authority to hear the case. I will not go into too much details, but I just thought that it would be good to give two practical examples here, especially practical examples that I've dealt with in the arbitrations I was counsel in. The first one was in a case where there was a multi-tiered -tier dispute resolution clause. So there are certain condition precedents where parties may have to fulfill. For example, there may be a stipulated negotiation period for a period of 30 days where the upper management of both parties have to discuss, or there may be a condition precedent where you have mandatory mediation before a mediation center for a period of say 15 to 30 days. So in such a case, if these condition precedents are not fulfilled, it is not a jurisdiction issue, but it's an admissibility issue. So the arbitrator may then wish to consider, is it appropriate after the arbitration has commenced, to then stay the arbitration proceedings, allow these condition precedents to be fulfilled before you go on to the next step to hear the arbitration. The next case I was working on was a case where the claim was time barred. In this case, is it a jurisdiction or admissibility issue? This is an admissibility issue because there may be certain claims in an arbitration for example, there may be five claims, but one or two claims may have been time barred. So the arbitrator actually has jurisdiction to continue listening to the other two to three claims that are not time barred. So what I hope today is to give um, participants here a good flavor of what are the in issues that an international arbitrator should consider in a practical manner when dealing with jurisdictional challenges. So now I'll give the table to um, Dr. Tidarat, who will talk to you more about 
uh, the jurisdictional challenges in an investment treaty arbitration. Uh, I hope you can hear me, right? Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Catherine, so much for providing a lot of useful information that could relate to my topic as well. But I decided to be focusing on, um, we'll be focusing on the issue of investor straight arbitration instead because to avoid overlapping with Catherine. And I feel that the issue of jurisdictional challenges is particularly crucial for this type of application. Uh, although I seem to have a lot of slides, but I will just briefly mention each of them. I might not go into detail. Actually, I plan to only two slides, but because of accident, I just left the hospital, so I don't have time to reorganize it. But I hope you will be able to follow my presentation within a very short time. So basically, uh, let's start with some background first. What is mean by investor state arbitration? Some people call international investment arbitration or treaty-based arbitration, and particularly on the issue of jurisdictional challenges. But before we go to that, I would like to uh, show you some uh, actual background first. This statistic quoted by the UNTAD. So basically, uh, UNTAD reported that uh, since 1987, uh, there are in total about 100 uh, Ninety cases of the uh, treaty-based arbitration. So uh, this, you can see that although they're not that um, many, that high in number compared to international commercial arbitration, but this this one, each of them, you know, involve the high value of transactions that you may know. Some of them, you know, involve the oil and gas industry on construction infrastructures, you know, those type of things. Even the tax regime as well. So, and uh, just to show you very quickly, just for some of you that might not familiar with this type of arbitration. So basically for this type of arbitration, most of the time, if you see the case name, the party that will appear as the list pundit will be the name of certain country because it's about the case where the foreign investor bring the case against the host state under the applicable treaty. And according to this end from UNTAD, you can see that the, the country in the last 10 years, basically 2012 to 2021, the country that, that be sued or arbitrated against the most basically is Spain, which is at 53. So this is the, the country that got sued most often, most frequent under the uh, ISDS or uh, arbitration investment arbitration regime. You may ask why Spain, if you follow the news, because Spain, they change, the, they have the legislative reform regarding the renewal of the feed-in tariff when, when the, the benefit or the incentive for the investor have been reduced under the new law and even have a retrospect to the investment in Spain. So foreign investors, many companies sue Spain for the change in those uh, law, the incentive for renewable energy. So that's why Spain got to <laughs> the highest in the last 10 years. But if you look at the first since uh, 1987, the country that got sued or uh, be the, the most frequent respondent actually uh, is Argentina, although it's not shown here because on this page, it's only in the last 10 years. But since 1987, Argentina is the, the most frequent respondent. Why? Because uh, according to the, because of the, the financial crisis in 2000, 2001 in Argentina, Argentine, Argentine government had brought many of the, the law reform and some of them have some negative impact on the investor within the Argentina. So the, the number of the cases concerning respondent, which is Argentina is the highest one until today, which is about, I think 63 cases, even higher than Spain, if you look at the total number. But for the last 10 years, Spain is number one, the top respondent. So that is just to give you some ideas about the nature of the IS investor state dispute settlement or, or investor state arbitration, basically. Now I would like to bring you to this chart, which is going to be something that directly uh, related to my topic. If I let you look at the chart for a um, 
maybe a very short time because we don't have enough time for uh, the long discussion. But if you look at this statistic, can you notice something that might feel uh, something that intuitively it might contradict to your understanding or your, your perception? Can you find something weird, <laughs> basically? Uh, chart. So this is a. Uh, if you look at this is the uh, the cases that the sample include the cases under arbitration from 1987 to 2016. So same period of year, same sample of the case that that used to use for this study. But if you look at this, the first circle here, the first uh, figure here, figure four. You can see that 36%, as we will point out just the important part, 36% of the cases decided in favor of the host state, the respondent. 27% of the cases decided in favor of the foreign investor, the claimant. But then another figure, another circle here, the same year, the same sample or case study, but is reported. 59% decided in favor of the host state. Oh, sorry, 59% decided in favor of the foreign claimant, 59%. And 41% only decided in favor of the host state. Can you see that these two uh, charts, these two figures, at first glance, apparently look contradictory, look inconsistent. Why? Because they are the same year, same case, same samples. But the first one, more case, this more cases decide, more percentage decided in favor of the state. But under the same sample, same case study, same period of time, the second circle, lesser cases, lesser percentage decided in the state. That's why the fact that these two represent the same case study, same period of year. If you look at the next uh, report, which is about the same report, just different year, even in 18, 1987 to 2018, so one more year added to this data, still the same. The first circle reported that. Uh, 36% of the case decided in favor of the hosted respondent. And only 29% decided in favor of the foreign investor who is the claimant. And then again, if you look at the second or the second circle here, it seems contradictory again. 61% decided in favor of the foreign investor, the claimant. But only uh, 39 decided in favor of the host and the respondent. Why the two always seem to be contradictory here? One part of the answer or the part of the explanation, although not the whole explanation, but part of it, because if you read carefully these figures, you can see that the second figure here, it just focus on the Murray space. See? On the merit phase, if the case goes to the merit phase, maybe if we, we, we simplify it, we can say that first phase is the jurisdictional phase. Second phase, the so simplified version, it could be uh, uh, alleged in other way, but let's say that first phase is jurisdictional phase. The second phase is the merit phase. The second circle on both uh, statistics here focus only on the merit phase. So you can see that if the case goes to the merit phase, most of the time the foreign investor that sue the whole state in the arbitration usually is the winning or got the, the favorable outcome. Which means that, but why, why the first uh, circle uh, reported to you this way? Because the first circle here, the first figure here, is report the, the overall process, including jurisdictional phase. So what it means is that uh, 36 percent here is also take into account the case where the arbitrator declined jurisdiction as well. Because for the case of international investment arbitration, usually if you can, most of the time it's about the 
the host state or the country being sued by the foreign investor. So once, because there is a treaty, the, the, uh, the foreign investor try to say that the host state is in breach or in violation of certain substantive obligation under a given, and that is the merits phase, the merits part of the case. So it means that if the lawyer representing the host state, the, the lawyer team, somehow can defend the case at the jurisdictional state and let it go through the next phase, which is the merit phase. Usually the host state can lose the case according to the statistics that provide by, provided by the Anton here. So in, I just want to uh, summarize that in the case of our international investment arbitration or ISDS or treaty-based arbitration, the real battles started at right at the jurisdictional phase. So one of the most important defense, I have to say, strategic defense of the host state is jurisdictional. What is mean by this? Basically, the decline, uh, declination of the jurisdiction or where, where the arbitrator decided that there is the lack, there is no jurisdiction for them to decide the case. It means the denial of treaty protection on the part of foreign investor. So that's why for the case of international investment arbitration or investor state uh, arbitration, usually the on even just on the issue of jurisdictional phase, that could you know run up to months or years because it's the main battle here. So uh, I like to just to give you like very brief example. I might not show the slide though, but just to show you what are the example of the defense that could be the jurisdictional defense. So most of the lawyer in this, in this area even refer to this type of situation as a jurisdictional defense or strategic defense of the host state. So in, in this case, for example, because the consent to arbitrate come from the treaty in this case, uh, which is quite unique for the international investment arbitration. So therefore, in order for the investor to be qualified or to be protected or to be covered by this treaty to get the protection, they have to qualify or uh, be covered by the definition of the treaty. For example, you have to check the, whether the claimant, the foreign investor, is an investor under the treaty. You have to check the definition of investor, usually under Article 1. Also, the definition of investment whether the type of investment is you know, in, in accordance with the definition that defined in the treaty. And you have to look at a bit by bit or the treaty that are applicable to your case. You can't just look at the, the other tribunal ruling only because each case governed by a different treaty. The wording of treaty is the highest authority uh, for your case. So you have to check all of those. Definition of investor, definition of investment, or sometimes in the definition, they might have the, uh, the clause that we call in accordance with hosted law clause as well. In accordance with hosted law. This is, could be in some theory they have this clause as well. So they require that the investment apart from for under the definition of investment, but also be the investment in accordance with hosted law. So sometimes you might find that uh, some breach of, for, for example, equity participation requirement like the Thai Foreign Business Act or even the requirement for EIA, you know, or even the rivalry sometimes could raise the issue of whether or not investment, that investment is than the whole state law. And if it's not, or sometimes we call legality of the investment, if it's not legal, that investment not legal, some bit and some arbitrators under some certain bit of treaty and some arbitrator might also decline jurisdiction as well. Although there are a lot of detail on that. But basically these are some things that could be the um, jurisdictional challenges that might be faced by the arbitrator. And lastly, not just on the side of investor that you have to check definition of investor, definition of investment, the in accordance with host us, Lastly, you should also check on the side of the country as well, whether that particular enti uh, entity that you want to bring the case again, is, can there be attributed to the 
uh, attributable to the host state. For example, there is a case that uh, uh, the arbitrator look at the, the strategic function of the airport authority in Poland. Poland tried to say that under their own law, this airport authority is actually independent entity, but arbitrator not looking at the domestic regime, how they define this entity. They say that because airport authority also perform some strategic function for the Polish government. So it could be attributed to the Poland as well. So they have the jurisdiction. So this is the end of my presentation. I just wanted just to say that under uh, the regime of international investment law, jurisdictional challenge is the heart of the, <laughs> the battle. So uh, everyone should be aware of this and arbitrators should deal with this type of issue very properly and carefully. Oh, thank you for uh, listening to my presentation. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Catherine and Dr. Didalat uh, for sharing uh, this insight, practicable and valuable knowledge uh, about international investment protection and also the challenge across the uh, jurisdiction regarding enforcing the international uh, arbitration award, particularly the investor state arbitration that there are many factors involved. Okay, so thank you very much. Now I think uh, it's about the time to move to the next section uh, on the topic of evidently issue across international tribunal in the inventor state habitations. In this section, we are honored to have Dr. Hatrawat Jongjit, our founder member. She will be the main speaker to this topic. And Kunopamat and I will also be a co-panelist. Firstly, let me introduce uh, Dr. Pat to you. Dr. Pat currently serves as the Director of Center for Tech Law and the Director of Certificate in Tactation Program at Thammasat Law School. She previously served as an assistant dean to the Faculty of Law Thammasat University. Besides, she is a member of Center for Business and Commercial Law at Thammasat University. Her expertise earlier focused on investment law, international investment law, uh, law on security and stock exchange and capital market regulation, international trade, banking and finance, construction and public contract, and and tactations. Now, everybody, please welcome Dr. Pat. Uh, thank you, Vaya. Thank you, Thailand uh, Arbitration Institute, as well as uh, uh, Kun Dusati and Kun Nopamad for inviting me uh, to join this event. And I would like to thank other members of Bangkok Arbitration Club as well. Uh, I think this will be a great opportunity to share our academic and practitioner perspective on international commercial and investment arbitration. And uh, my topic today is about the uh, evidentiary issue across uh, international application. As his honor just sorry mentioned at the outset that uh, in international arena, the evidentiary issue is uh, complex. This is uh, one reason is because uh, if you look at uh, international uh, uh, arena, you can see that uh, it's not belong to civil law or common law tradition, but instead uh, it's mixed between common law and civil law. And as international adjudicator or arbitrator, uh, we need to balance uh, between uh, the civil law and common law tradition to provide a fairness as well as efficiency to the disputing party and international uh, business and international trade and investment as a whole. This is uh, the key point that I would like to present uh, this issue today. Uh, actually, uh, in uh, among these three topics, or as uh, assistant professor Tida last mentioned, uh, uh, all three issues is the critical issue in international uh, arbitration process, like uh, Dr. Tida Rat uh, and Catherine uh, Kiley uh, discussed about jurisdictional issue, but following that based on the consent of party autonomy, procedural and evidence is the next one. And of course, uh, uh, enforcement of award is uh, uh, all these three topics are important. And um, 
I think, uh, first of all, I would like to uh, provide you with uh, some uh, background uh, of the issue a little bit. I think uh, not in only in international arbitration, but I think in all decision making process, uh, as well as in uh, domestic and inter international adjudication, uh, evidentiary issue is uh, important. And uh, I would like you to think why uh, evidence is important. Anybody can uh, advise me why evidence is important? Uh, I, we will discuss about this later. And uh, if evidence is important, uh, the way a behavior counsel uh, approach uh, the evidentiary issue in arbitral procedure will be important. This is uh, what uh, we will uh, discuss uh, throughout uh, uh, this uh, presentation. Because um, evidentiary issue cover a number and several aspect. Uh, myself alone uh, cannot uh, address all uh, evidentiary issue, but uh, in uh, the later part uh, of this presentation, I might give you some example uh, aspect that uh, uh, create a debatable and controversy in ISDS uh, jurisdiction. For example, burden of proof, standard of proof, adverse inference, presumption. Uh, that this is, uh, I will show you the divergent approach that international uh, tribunal applied uh, to that case and lead to different outcome. But uh, among, uh, before we uh, discuss uh, that issue, uh, let me show you uh, the 10 key points that I would like to uh, discuss uh, to you and uh, all of you today. Firstly, as academic, uh, I might uh, give some brief discussion of the theoretical foundation of international application. This will be a principle that under underlying both domestic and international application process. After we understand uh, the principle, we need to understand uh, why uh, evidentiary issue is important. So the second point that I will discuss is the significances of evident uh, treatment of evidence in international arbitration process. After we understand the principle, after uh, understand the significance, next uh, we will look at the difference between domestic arbitration and international arbitration. And of course, uh, we need to know and understand the factor that contributing to the diversity or complexity in international arbitration processing. And uh, as a lawyer, as an adjudicator, we need to also understand the legal basis uh, for uh, treatment of evidence. And uh, you might wonder uh, if we have a divergent approach or different approach uh, regarding evidence, why uh, are there any international rules or uh, harmonization initiative that uh, try to balance or harmonize uh, the treatment of evidence in international adjudication or international application? The answer is yes. Next, we will look at the international rules or uh, soft law that try to harmonize uh, the practice or the treatment of evidence in international arbitration. However, that is still a problem. And uh, we will discuss why uh, the remaining, uh, why the issue or divergent efforts remain in international arena. And uh, following this, uh, I will uh, touch upon some aspects uh, of divergent approach that I have found for my research uh, from the ISDS case. And uh, the, I will... I think uh, Dr. Pat may have some problem about the uh, her, her, her internet signal. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, I, I, I can I can talk why she not come back yet. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, no problem. So actually for the uh, uh, evident evident issues, we, we have to understand that uh, for the international arbitration that will be like both uh, uh, common laws and civil law system all together so how we how sometimes in the in the same uh, in, in in the 
tribunal, you will have like the, the two tribunal from common law and the one uh, tribunal from, from the civil law, how they, how they uh, consider the, the evidence. If you, if, if we come back to the, if we come back to our uh, arbitration act, we will say, we, we, we can see from the uh, uh, section uh, 25 of uh, Thai Arbitration Act that actually uh, the act gives the power to the, to the tribunal to consider how to uh, consider about the, the evidence, whether or not the, the tribunal can include or exclude uh, the, the, the evidence, right? But on the other hand, uh, for the, 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 the common laws, the, the US, they have the discovery, discovery process. Some people said, say that that is the burden of the uh, evidence production. Uh, contrary to the civil law system that uh, the, the tribunal or the judge maybe uh, have the very uh, narrow scope of uh, evidence production. So you can see that uh, when you come to the international arbitration, this is the issue that international arbitrators have to deal with, right? So how uh, even though even though our uh, uh, section 25 arbitration act give the power to the tribunal, but if multinational tribunal come together, that that is something that that may be uh, another uh, headache uh, issue. So. <laughs> <laughs> then, then, then you then you come to see the 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 rules of the institute right uh tai rules also give quite a burden of the 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 room for the the tribunal to consider so come to this point i, I will come back <laughs> but but i i like to refer to one thing that uh is kind of the the soft law creation to uh to breathing both common law and uh, and 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 civil laws uh, based on the uh, evidence issue. That uh, if 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 someone if if anyone heard about the international uh, barrister IBA association, I uh, we call the IB, IBA rules on the evidence taking of the evidence. So I think that uh, our arbitrator new arbitrator or anyone want to practice the international arbitrator, probably you need to know about these uh, IBA rules on the taking on the evidence, right? So I, I will talk about this later, but I let uh, Dr. Pat come back to, to her point. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, Kuno Pramat. I'm back. And uh, let's start with uh, uh, the first point. As uh, uh, Kuno Pramat mentioned about the difference uh, between a uh, civil law approach and a uh, common law approach. And uh, let's get back to the uh, theoretical foundation that's underlying the treatment of evidence in international application a little bit. And before uh, we discuss the legal basis, uh, let's uh, look at uh, um, let look at uh, the theoretical uh, foundation of uh, uh, underlying uh, both domestic and international application. And you will see that um, this is the source of the problem. Uh, is, um, uh, you can see that uh, as uh, I think all of you know that uh, uh, application is uh, one uh, method of dispute resolution that uh, like Catherine said that is based on a uh, consent of the party or in the other word we call party autonomy. So three main principle underlying uh, domestic and international application uh, include a party autonomy, uh, confidentiality, and uh, finality or enforceability that uh, uh, Manini will discuss with us later. So based on uh, this uh, underlying or uh, philosophical principle uh, of arbitration, you can see that uh, the uh, arbitral tribunal or arbitrator uh, is appointed by the party to the dispute. And also based on party autonomy, uh, arbitral procedure is uh, quite flexible. 
uh, that provide uh, efficiency, like uh, save cost and time for the disputing party, and also based on uh, the party autonomy, uh, the arbitral award, your decision uh, is final and binding. That is mean uh, there is no chance for appeal, uh, which is uh, different. Uh, this is the advantage of arbitration over litigation process. So in the theory, uh, this is a three main uh, principle underlying both domestic and international arbitration. And you can see that uh, these three main principle uh, offer uh, advantage of arbitration over litigation process. But at the same time, uh, this principle have some uh, create some concern in international arbitration as well. I think could not permit uh, give you uh, the answer already. Like uh, when uh, it's come to the flexibility, you can see that uh, rather than follow the uniform set of procedural law or evidence law of the country, uh, in most cases, uh, the uh, evidentiary issue remains with the discretion of the arbitrator or the tribunal. This is uh, making it uh, difficult and complex for the council disputing party and uh, arbitrator themselves. So this is the underlying uh, principle that uh, underlie uh, both domestic and international investment and commercial arbitration. And uh, after uh, we understand uh, the theoretical or principle underlying uh, domestic and international arbitration, and you can see that the party autonomy is the a key principle that uh, lead to uh, the evidentiary issue as well. So uh, before we discuss the legal basis uh, of the evidentiary issue, the next question is, um, as a uh, why uh, a behavior or counsel uh, should be aware of uh, evidence in international arbitral process and why this issue is important. Uh, first of all, we understand uh, the party autonomy, uh, we understand the confidentiality and final finality principle underlying application. Next, we need to understand uh, the significance of uh, evidentiary issue in the uh, uh, the arbitral process, like uh, 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 like Kuno Pamat might uh, add uh, some comment on this uh, later. You can see that in any adjudication process, uh, uh, once the tribunal uh, is established or appointed by the party in the procedure, uh, the key issue is a uh, uh, legal issue on the one hand and the factual finding on the other hand. So uh, as an adjudicator or as an arbitrator, you need to interpret the law or apply law to fact and your task and one of your important tasks is the factual finding. So uh, based on this, you can see that uh, different approach of evidence uh, may lead to different uh, outcome of the dispute. So this is the significance uh, of the evidentiary issue in any adjudication process, not arbitration. But arbitration is more complex because uh, uh, you have uh, more discretion uh, regarding the treatment of evidence. So Kuno uh, 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 you would like to add uh, some experience or some comment on, on the significance of evidence in um, litigation or arbitration process. Uh, let, let I share my 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 ex, uh, my practical experience. When I uh, work as the um, the arbitral uh, counsel, the, the in the first uh, meeting, the tribunal. This is a case in in Singapore. The tribunal asked the first question to the the party that uh, to to the counsel that. Which uh, evidence rules that uh, you wish to use in this uh, in this case, either uh, IBA rules or uh, ICC. So this we have to understand that the uh, this soft law is actually IBA rules on the evidence. We call it the guideline. It's not the it's not the actual rules, right? So, but anyone in the in the international arbitration practice know that. Why? What is the reason why they have to choose this kind of uh, evidence uh, rules in the in in the uh, arbitral uh, hearing, mm -hmm. right? So be because usually uh, we not uh, not include the information or the agreement based on the evidence rules in the arbitration agreement, right? 
no one know but you will know when you come to the <laughs> when you come to the hearing right so that 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 is something i think that is important because uh, in my experience for handling the uh arbitral proceeding in thailand we rarely know about the iba rules but mm -hmm. if you if you go outside if you practice in 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 other country especially in the common law a country they will ask that which kind of rule do you want and uh, mostly they they not only iba icc and it can be uh, another uh, park rules for example this is something uh, we need to learn and need to understand when we practice at the uh, tribunal or the arbitral uh, council what kind of the uh, uh, iba rules i think now, if, if someone Google now, it's, it's, it's just like a, a, a small book that contain the uh, 20, 30 pages of the rules. This is only rule for the evidence. And um, when you choose to, to follow the IBA, then I think mm -hmm. that you have to understand these 30 pages uh, 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 document, right? So the same thing, why we have to understand this because uh, the different, the different uh, background of the, the party and even the, the tribunal, it is something that people have to come uh, to, to, to choose something because the evidence is uh, concerning back up uh, your case, right? Your case, whether or not you, if you request something like uh, the document that uh, the, the document that is really essential to your case, but maybe that that document is uh, kept it long time ago, and and if you want to retrieve it, it may cost a uh, lot of uh, money to the other side who process the evidence, right? And and the, the opposing party who have to comply with the uh, the, the the order or, le, or the request to hand in the uh, evidence will I think would would be very likely to object that this is cause the unreasonable burden to them mm -hmm. to the opposing party and that's why as the tribunal have to decide whether or not you uh, as the tribunal will grant uh, mm -hmm. the permission for the uh, requesting party to obtain such uh, a document in the archive somewhere, right? Okay. That 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 is my point as a as a as a council. Yeah. So yes, uh, thank you, Kuno Pramad. And uh, from my standing, I think uh, in most cases, uh, the tribunal uh, decide uh, the dispute uh, on the fact. So that is why uh, the evidentiary issue or approach, uh, the treatment of evidence is important in uh, international arbitration. So this is uh, the, the second point uh, that I would like to uh, uh, to, uh, to to focus and after we understand uh, the principle underlying international arbitration as well as the significance of evidentiary issue, uh, uh, the third point that I would like uh, to present uh, to all of you today is uh, the uh, the difference uh, between uh, domestic and international adjudication. And actually, uh, this point um, uh, was mentioned at the outset already that uh, maybe in domestic system we might think about civil and commercial court, uh, but in international adjudication there is uh, some difference. And uh, I will give you some example of divergent approach of uh, evidentiary issue just to show you a little bit like uh what uh, uh my uh uh the, the the different approach of evidence so uh you can see that uh in domestic dispute or in domestic system uh like uh like in domestic uh, transaction sometimes in domestic case uh we have to follow the court rules or the domestic law uh but uh in international adjudication uh, uh the difference uh, between domestic uh, and international is that in international uh, adjudication process uh we have a different legal culture and uh in international arena 
uh, the international arbitration like tend to have a board discretion than domestic tribunal. And uh, let us uh, see some example of the difference between uh, common law and civil law uh, in relation to the evidence in international arbitration. This is uh, like uh, Kuno Pramat mentioned uh, when uh, I was absent from the, from, from the meeting. Like for example, the boss document production or the party as a witness or witness torching uh, and party employee expert. This is some example of uh, uh, the uh, uh, different aspect between civil law and common law. And uh, could could Nupamad, could you uh, add uh, some more comments or give some more example regarding the difference uh, of evidence uh, between common law and uh, civil law approach? Um, as I as I, I, I told you that um, uh, for the common law approach, actually, even the common law approach, they, they still have the different, how to say, different shade of the common law, right? So um, the, the discovery process of uh, the U.S. would be uh, different also from the, 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 the document production of the English law, for example, right? That it, even somebody uh, said that uh, the 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 approach for document production uh, for the uh, common law is uh, broadened and is depend on uh, the the parties um, that make such requests uh, to the tribunal and then or the to the judge, right? But for the for the uh, for the civil law, it is it is uh, not the adversarial. Uh, process and 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 the, the scope of the the document production uh, uh, should be would be uh, narrower than the the, the uh, common law approach so um, that is something I think that um, the, the, the domestic law and the, the style of the the, the legal backgrounds for the law of evidence uh, of uh, any country is, is different. That's why, that why we will need to have some uh, middle way uh, to cons for, the, for the tribunal and for the party to consider. Let's say what, what would be the useful uh, to use the IBA rules as a soft law or the guideline for the uh, law of evidence that, yeah, they even, they, they said in you you have to see the 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 IBA rules uh the the version 2010 and 2020 that is some have some kind of a different different uh uh different score because the 2020 version also provides some of the the cloud for the tribunal to exclude the document production. For example, if uh, that request for the document production is caused uh, a listenable burden, or uh, it may be caused uh, uh, sensitivity uh, issues concerning the personal data protection, that, that you would be surprised, right? Why, why uh, the tribunal have also uh, concerning about the 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 the, the uh, personal data protection. So this this is uh, quite a uh, trendy topic for the tribunal because in other country like the European country they pay a lot of attention to the GDPR the uh, personal data protection document. If we as the uh, uh, as the claimant council we want some kind of the document that maybe that, that documents also containing the third party information. So the tribunal may, may consider if you want uh, said uh, evidence, then the tribunal will have to consider how to protect the, the information of the third party as well. This kind of thing is it come to this time that uh, you, cannot only focus on only the arbitration rules or the uh, arbitration laws, but also uh, other related law. Or even you want to, uh, like the ISDS case, right? 
usually the 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 in uh, the uh, private party the foreign investor want to uh, call for the uh, the document from the the government units that may be contain very sensitive national security information do you think that the, the tribunal i think that that is the the hard issue the difficult issue for the, the the tribunal to to consider how to how to balance uh and make it fair for both party because one thing is is the national security and it may affect not only the country but affect the 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 public interest of the less abundant right so that 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 is something uh as a tribunal you may need to to consider this and and balance it so that that is my point here Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pat and Kun Nopama for sharing very uh, inside knowledge with us about the different treatment of evidence in domestic and in the, in the international uh, adjudication. And also uh, Dr. Pat, uh, Dr. Pat for providing us the daily foundation underlying in the treatment of evidence in international arbitration and Kun Nopama to share your experience, how does it work in practice? Okay, last but not least, our section will be on the topic of essential for enforceable arbitral award reading. We are honored to have Mrs. Uh, Manini Brad and Mrs. Oka Botengo, our founder members, to present on this topic. We will start with Mrs. Manini. She is a head of arbitration practice in New Delhi, India, and is currently acting as arbitrator in several commercial arbitration institutes. She has been pra uh, practicing in the area of international law and arbitration, both commercial and investor state arbitration since 2010. Before setting up her independent practice, Manini has the post of consultant investment division, Ministry of Finance, Government of India, and as why the government on the review and negotiation of international investment agreement and related investor state arbitrations. Previously, she has worked as a deputy counsel with the Secretary of ICC Court of Arbitration in Hong Kong. She acts as tribunal secretary and counsel in international commercial arbitration and represent the government of India in investor state disputes. Manini has a master degree from University of Cambridge and has been a part of the Bachelor in National Law University, Delhi, in India, where she administrates a course on investor state dispute settlement now, everybody, please welcome Mrs. Uh, Manini. Thank you so much, Kundu Sadi, for that wonderful introduction. And hello to everyone from India. Congratulations to all for what is already turning out to be a wonderful inauguration ceremony uh, with so many interesting presentations. Um, and there are so many layers to this initiative uh, of bringing practitioners from Asia to the forefront and of promoting diversity um, that I'm very eager to watch it unfold together with all the audience here. So congratulations uh, to everyone. Uh, as uh, Hundu Sadi has al already mentioned, my topic is uh, essentials of award writing. Uh, I'll quickly share my PowerPoint as well. Uh, Olga Boltenko uh, was to accompany me uh, on this panel, but she's unfortunately been called away on an emergency in her family. Uh, although we do have the benefit of her pre-recorded presentation, uh, which will be aired shortly. So uh, coming to my presentation, when we talk about the enforceability of arbitral awards, of course, we must begin with a hat tip to the New York Convention on the recognition and enforcement of arbitral awards 1958, 
which has given structure and stability to the framework of international arbitration for nearly 65 years now. Uh, the standards of enforceability are most commonly drawn uh, from the provisions of the New York Convention, particularly Article 5, uh, which should be on your screens now, and uh, to some extent from the ancestral model law, Article 36, uh, which has inspired the arbitration statutes of many countries. Uh, I'm approaching this topic from the point of view of what arbitrators need to be mindful of uh, while they conduct the arbitration and write their procedural orders and awards. Uh, so very quickly, with respect to the, to the New York Convention, you will see that uh, the convention requires uh, that recognition and enforcement of the award may be refused in certain circumstances. The, the two things that are crucial with respect to the convention is that the language used is permissive. That means even if the grounds uh, under Article 5 are made out in a challenge, uh, the court of the place of enforcement has the discretion to either enforce the award or not. So they are not mandatory grounds. The other thing to remember about the New York Convention is that the grounds under Article 5 are exhaustive. So a party uh, before a court, which is a state party to the convention, cannot raise any grounds other than the ones that have been listed uh, in Article 5. Uh, from an arbitrator's perspective, what are the main flagposts of these provisions? One, uh, as uh, Catherine before me has already highlighted, uh, are matters of jurisdiction. Uh, and you will see that uh, if the arbitration agreement is for some reason invalid or the parties are under some sort of incapacity, uh, then those are matters of jurisdiction that are required to be dealt with uh, by the arbitrator, either in a separate phase of the arbitration, as Catherine mentioned, uh, or in a separate and distinct part of the arbitral award, uh, so that there is no question uh, that the arbitration arbitrator has overlooked an issue of jurisdiction. Another aspect of jurisdiction, which is also drawn from the New York Convention Clause C, is that the arbitrator cannot exceed the reference uh, of the agreement of the parties uh, or the submissions of the parties in deciding the award. So he or she should not be deciding anything that goes beyond what has been submitted to him or her. Partly for this reason, it is considered a very good practice to identify early on in the arbitration the issues that are made out from the party's pleadings, either in the terms of reference, if it is an ICC arbitration, or uh, in a separate procedural order. What that does is it allows the, the person looking at the award at the final stage to simply compare what were the issues before uh, the arbitrator in the beginning and whether each of those issues has been addressed and nothing further has been decided by the arbitrator. So if you look at the ICC award checklist, which is circulated to arbitrators at the time when they render final awards or other awards, there is a section that requires the arbitrator to confirm that the award deals with all the issues uh, and parties claims including the party's most recent request for a brief and decides nothing more than those issues and claims. Uh, so this is a very important aspect of jurisdiction, which uh, the arbitrator must be mindful of, in addition to the challenges of jurisdiction that are of course routinely raised uh, and which Catherine has dealt with in detail. So I will not uh, delve into them again. The other thing that uh, arbitrators must be mindful of are matters of procedure. Again, there are two aspects to this. One is questions of due process. That means the parties on either side should have had adequate notice of the arbitral process, of the appointment of the arbitrators, of all the decisions that are eventually taken in the arbitration. So as a rule of thumb, it is very important for the arbitrator to always invite comments 
from the from the other side with respect to any application or any procedural order that it is about to issue that just ensures that this requirement of due process is adequately met and the other requirement is that whatever procedure is followed uh, in the arbitration should be compliant with the applicable uh, agreement of the parties which may be reflected in institutional rules or uh, with the law of the place of arbitration and again, just to refresh uh, 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 the reference, this goes back to uh, the provisions of the New York Convention, particularly Clause B, which requires uh, the party to be given proper notice of appointment of arbitration of the arbitrator and also of the arbitration proceedings um, and to have the ability to present his case. And it also goes uh, to Clause D, which says that the arbitral procedure uh, is required to be in accordance with the agreement of the parties and the law of the place of arbitration. So with respect to procedure, these are two things that the arbitrator must keep in mind. And uh, it is important particularly uh, to identify uh, early on the aspects of the law or the applicable rules which are mandatory in nature. For example, in India, the arbitral award must be rendered within a certain time period, which is 12 months from the time when the pleadings are complete, unless the parties agree to an extension. So if the award is beyond this time limit, then effectively what happens is that the mandate of the tribunal terminates unless an extension is granted by an Indian court. And whatever award is rendered beyond the time limit uh, is automatically rendered unenforceable. So these are uh, aspects which the arbitrator should be aware of. Uh, and I think a good way of doing this uh, is to, if there is any question regarding the mandatory nature of certain rules of the place of arbitration, to invite submissions of the parties uh, on those aspects uh, right in the beginning or at the appropriate stage of the arbitration. Uh, another aspect on which submissions of the parties are very relevant are uh, the aspects of non-arbitrability and public policy. Again, two grounds on which uh, an award can be set aside, can be refused enforcement, uh, I beg your pardon. The non-arbitrability, if it's defined in simple terms, is that a certain subject matter of certain kinds of disputes has been kept out of the purview of arbitration by the law of uh, the, the place of enforcement or the place of arbitration uh, because there is a special national interest in the judicial rather than the arbitrable resolution of that subject matter. For example, in India, serious allegations of fraud are not arbitrable, uh, whereas civil allegations of fraud, i.e with respect to consent in execution of a contract are arbitrable. So the line between what is a serious allegation of fraud and what is a civil allegation of fraud is a very fluid one. Again, which is something that can only be effectively resolved in an international arbitration with the help of submissions from the parties or an expert on the subject. Uh, so the, the arbitrator must ensure that the dispute before him is arbitrable and uh, that there is no violation or contravention of fundamental aspects of pub public policy uh, of the place of arbitration slash the place of enforcement uh, when the award is rendered. Now, what are these aspects of uh, public policy? This again varies across jurisdictions. And uh, to tell you the truth in practice, public policy is more of a fallback phrase for everything. Uh, that um, that cannot be sort of uh, categorized in the other grounds of the Article 5 of the New York Convention, because it covers uh, issues of due process, it covers issues of non-arbitrability, it also covers certain formal and substantive requirements, uh, which the place of arbitration may have for the rendering of the award. Uh, even challenges to independence and impartiality of arbitrators is covered within the broad ambit of public policy. So really, this is something that uh, varies significantly uh, from place to place and jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And finally, uh, there are other matters of form and substance, 
uh, which are uh, usually set out in the in the arbitration statute of the place of arbitration and uh, inspired by article 31 of the ancestral model law uh, which requires for instance the award to be in writing to be signed uh, to be uh, reasoned uh, as to the reasons upon which it is based to mention the date and place of arbitration and to be delivered to each party in various uh, institutional rules you find different uh, reflections of uh, these standards and 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 they are also captured by the arbitration statutes of so many jurisdictions uh, so the, these are the formal requirements and the substantive requirements of course are cogency completeness certainty and finality in the award uh, so as to ensure that it is clear unambiguous it addresses all the issues that were put to the arbitrator it is capable of standing by itself without reference to any external material. And there is no room for a party to reopen any of the issues that are decided uh, in a final award. So these are the broad areas uh, which the arbitrator must focus on when uh, writing an enforceable award. Uh, the, the, the obvious question here is, we, the arbitrator when he's writing the award may not be able to contemplate uh, all the possible uh, jurisdictions where the award will be impossible. But of course, uh, the, the way to go about that is to identify a likely jurisdiction depending on where the, the possible award debtors assets or company is based and at least try and comply uh, with those requirements. Uh, with that, I will end my presentation and hand back to Poonapumad for Olga's presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, Manini, could, could you please, uh, I, I, I will stop your screen. Okay. Uh, My finding uh, of the presentation be patient with me. Okay. Uh, I, I would be, I, I can share it if you like. Uh, uh, okay, I, I found it. Uh, okay. okay, got it. I think uh, we 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 can we 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 cannot hear her voice. Could not come out. Uh, uh. Hang on, hang on. I have to do something. Uh, okay. Again. No, I I think I I cannot make it uh, happen for the for the voice. Can uh, Mani, may you please uh, try? I, I stop yes. my first. Yeah. Okay. Let me let me just see if it works. Uh, Good afternoon to the friends and colleagues in the arbitration community. Congratulations to everybody on the formation of the Bangkok Arbitration Club.
That is a wonderful initiative that is inclusive, contemporary, dynamic, and very creative. You will see that the founding members and the current membership bring a wealth of ideas on dispute resolution, including on Web3 disputes and other topical issues. Watch out for our webinars and in-person events that are currently in the planning and are coming soon. Much like Thailand itself, the Bangkok Club is very inclusive and welcomes all new members into the fold. Today, it is my absolute great pleasure to share the panel on drafting enforceable awards with Manini Bra. He's a fellow lawyer, formerly from Hong Kong, which is where we met for the first time many years ago, and now an active arbitrator. The topic that we're covering with Manini today is of tremendous importance for the arbitrators as they operate essentially and largely with a view to navigate all the pitfalls and dangers in seeking to issue a stellar enforceable award that will not be subject to setting aside. Now, earlier today, Manini has set out a brilliant overview of the topic and setting out the legal framework for the duty of arbitrators to issue enforceable awards. That legal framework is the building stones of arbitrators' work. And that, of course, includes that New York Convention, formal and substantive requirements for the awards, and also special considerations of the law of the place of the arbitration or the legal seat of the arbitration. And of course, uh, uh, domestic laws uh, brought into the fold by reference to domestic law of the legal seat of the arbitration. Now, my role on the panel is to give a council perspective on the issue of drafting enforceable awards. As many of you would know, in your personal experience, the role of counsel is multifaceted and has at its heart the interest of the client. Of course, having due regard to the integrity of the arbitration in the ideal world. That is a very different focus from the focus of an arbitral tribunal. I guarantee that there is no arbitrator in the world who has not been threatened even once in his or her career as an arbitrator by a party counsel that is issuing a procedural decision, the tribunal is depriving a party of a reasonable opportunity to present its case or substantively by finding in favor of the other party that the tribunal would be rendering an award that is not enforceable or worse and more dramatically perhaps that is subject to setting aside. Now, experienced arbitrators tend to take these threats in stride as something that is inherent to the role of an arbitrator and cannot be avoided. There may be even a bit of an eye-rolling situation with each such threat, in particular if the threat is not justifiable or is not substantiated by references to legal authorities. For a counsel threatening the tribunal in such a manner, the considerations that they have to continue with the tribunal that they actually have threatened until the resolution of the dispute, and that is an important strategic consideration. Other arbitrators, in particular, when the so-called threats of the awards being not enforceable were subject to setting aside, um, view this, in particular if the threats are justified with proper references to the legal authority, view such threats or rather submissions as something very helpful, in particular if such submissions are made gracefully and with a joint goal of issuing an enforceable award. Younger arbitrators, um, from experience, tend to get somewhat fettered a bit um, with each such threat. And it is frankly and admittedly unpleasant to be threatened every step of the way, whatever you do as an arbitrator. I recall one of the arbitrators I used to work for as a tribunal secretary many years ago, in fact, was so annoyed by the party's persistent reservation of rights with each procedural decision that the arbitrator would issue, that he had to make a statement to that party saying, all right, I hear you. I understand that your client's rights are reserved until further notice, so you don't have to tell me that your rights are reserved with every communication. 
Now, council uh, conduct in this regard is a vast and interesting subject that deserves a long conversation. And perhaps at one of the Bangkok Arbitration Club meetings, in-person meetings in Bangkok, where we could share all of the stories, voice stories and a few laughs. But being mindful of the time here, I would highlight only a few points that I think are pertinent on the topic. First, the council threats or submissions preferences when it comes to the tribunal's procedural decisions. And second, the tribunal's substantive decisions in rendering in the wood. So when it comes to the procedural decisions, this is perhaps a more dynamic area as the arbitrations unfold uh, and procedural decisions are issued, such as say allowing additional time for a party to submit the submission or disallowing ambush or late evidence or deciding a document production request or ordering discovery or issuing approvals for the party to apply for court assistance and other such decisions. These are important procedural decisions and parties tend to get quite emotional about such decisions. Now, um, counsel as well, tend to take those decisions at heart and rather actively issue threats of their word being not enforceable if the tribunal does not decide the procedural issue to their liking or in their favor. There, I'd make two points. First, the main threat um, that there is, is the tribunal decides the procedural application one way or the other, a party may then apply to set aside an award on the basis that the party was not given a reasonable opportunity to present its case. And that is something that Manini mentioned earlier today, or that the procedure was not in accordance with the party's agreement. Now there, faced with such threats and to appease the arbitrator's minds, it is fair that the supervisory court would actually set aside an award on the basis of such procedural decisions, unless these decisions are outrageously and manifestly skewed towards one party. And unless a party can prove oftentimes that the party had suffered prejudice and that had the decision been different, the award would have been different as well. Now, this is a very high threshold to reach and not only before the court, but it is also a very high threshold to reach for a counsel to convince the client to pay for such a setting aside application. Because in majority of jurisdictions, the courts will apply indemnity basis uh, fees and costs for um, frivolous applications to set aside an award. Now, second important point here is that um, the tribunal's substantive decisions on the merits of the case. That is where oftentimes the threats of non-enforceable awards are issued. There, of course, while they're often digressing and lengthy submissions by counsel that should the tribunal find in favor of the other party, that decision would not be enforceable. And such submissions are, again, indeed quite helpful to the extent that they help guide the tribunal to an enforceable award, especially if such uh, submissions are made gracefully and non-aggressively. However, there, the considerations are that first, there needs to be a distinction between enforceability of an award and the award being vulnerable to a setting aside application. When it comes to enforceability of an award, there may be several jurisdictions involved. In fact, in large disputes involving parties with global operations and assets worldwide, the scope of enforceability considerations would simply be unworkable if the tribunal were to consider all and any potential jurisdictions where an award may be taken for enforcement. And even then, such consideration in each particular jurisdiction may be different given the different domestic legislation that may apply to the enforcement proceedings. The ultimate point here is that, as Manini has set out earlier, the New York Convention provides only very limited grounds for refusal to enforce an award. And those grounds typically would not include allowing 
enforcement courts to reopen the dispute on the merits and to consider mistakes of law issues. There, of course, the client would also have to pay for an unsuccessful enforcement uh, resistance application. And that's something that counsel trying to convince the client has to bear in mind. Now, when it comes to the awards vulnerability to setting aside, many similar considerations apply. There are only very limited grounds to set aside an award, in particular in ancestral model law jurisdictions. And unless you're seated in the UK and under the UK Arbitration Act, a mistake in law is unlikely a ground on which a party may successfully set aside an award. Plus, there are, of course, indemnity costs for frivolous setting aside applications. Now, with that, that is a very long way to say that counsel do often use the threat of the award not being enforceable or being subject to setting aside. But those threats are only effective when they are issued with proper substantiation and reference to the relevant legal authorities, and when such threats genuinely are made or threat submissions are made to advance the goal of issuing a stellar enforceable award that will not be subject to setting aside. With that, I'll hand the floor over back to Manini. Thank you very much, everyone, for your attention, and hopefully we'll see you again very soon at the Bangkok Arbitration Club meetings. Handing over to you, Nopramat. Okay. Uh, so thank you, uh, Manini and Alka, and thank you to our speaker again for the crystal clear explanation and sharing this really helpful insight and practicable knowledge with us. I do believe that all of our section today will be of great benefit to all participants. And we would like to thank you to all participants for taking your valuable time to join us today. Unfortunately, we are running out of time and we'll have to close our event for today. I will give the floor to Kun Nopamat, our chair of Bangkok Habitation Club, for the closing remark. Uh. Okay, thank you, Kundusadi. And I think that uh, we successfully uh, made uh, the, 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 the great uh, inauguration uh, event for the Bangkok uh, Arbitration Club today. And, and I, I, I have to give the special thanks to the Thai Arbitration Institute and uh, Judge Sorowit and, and his team that always support uh, our our event. And this cannot be happened without TAI's uh, strong support. And and also as we can see that this is the, it's just like uh, we open the, the door to the world and we meet uh, true friends. We meet uh, many friends here. And I, I, I believe that uh, our Thai habitation community will have uh, a lot more friends from, from now on and to help more, uh, learn more from our friends and exchange our knowledge with the uh, uh, international arbitration community. So for today, uh, thank you everyone. And I hope that we will have uh, this kind of event again uh, soon and uh, every year. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good night.